And here we go. So scaling team delivery using standardization. What's that about? So yes, my name is Debbie O'Brien. I'm head developer advocate at BIT. For those of you that don't know what BIT is, it's a way to build component-driven development. So if you want to put your components first and start building components so you can scale easily, uh, BIT is the place. But I'm not going to talk much about that. I'm going to go into um, what we're here to talk about today. And I've already, like, you've already seen all the awards that I have. So yeah, this is it. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, Debs underscore O'Brien, my DMs are always open. So reach out to me at any moment if you need anything. So let's talk about the perfect team. The perfect team is when you have long-term developers that have been there with you for you know many years. They just work very, very well together and they know what they're doing and they know what you expect and they just do a perfect job. Everything is perfect. This is the perfect team and this is the perfect world. And if you have that, you don't need me to give this talk. However, the reality is that devs leave. We kind of leave our jobs quite a lot, actually, don't we? Every couple of years, they're changing. You know, new developers are joining as well. Our teams are getting bigger and bigger and scaling. Uh, some devs get promoted and then they get like, you know, a team lead position and they have to go and lead their own team. So we're literally like just constantly changing the teams around all the time. And that makes it very, very difficult to keep, you know, things standard. So how do you keep up with the constant team changes? How do you deliver software that looks like it was built by one team? How do you onboard new developers as they're joining? And how do you make sure that they abide by the standards? It's not easy, but there is a solution. Basically, you write a 25-page booklet, and you say to them, you got to do this. Use CSS modules. you got to write tests. you got to use testing library. you got to document your components. you got to add code examples. And you give them this 25-page booklet. And then you stand behind them with your cup of coffee and you watch as they make and make sure they read every single page. Easy, right? You just basically tell them, follow the instructions and you know, that's it. Everyone is gonna follow standards and everything will be perfect. Yeah, it's not really how things work though, is it? <laughs> if only, if only, we need a better solution. So what can we actually do? Well, first of all, we gotta figure out what do we need? You know, what do we need from our team? What standards do we actually want to create? And then we've got to try and automate that process because you know they're not going to read documentation. They're not going to read a book. So let's build a boilerplate, right? Let's build a boilerplate project. This is a perfect solution. You know, just clone the repo and then get to work. And I've done this so many times. I actually have a Nuxt boilerplate project and you can go to my GitHub repo and you can basically take it and you can use it and you have everything set up for you. Your ESLint, you're prettier. All those config files are done. Everything's done. It's fantastic. But <laughs> what happens when you want to update and um, maintaining a boilerplate project is hard. And sorry for those who are using my boilerplate project. I haven't updated it in like a while. So yeah, this is, this is kind of good to get quickly off the ground, but it's not the perfect solution. So let's use generators. Generators are great. Let me tell you a little bit about generators. With generators, you can generate code files and you can set them to how you want them. So you can generate specific files in specific uh, projects. So Hygen is one of my favorites and I use this actually in my Nuxt um, projects. It's in the Nuxt boilerplate. And it's a great way of basically just generating files. So like the head of the file, the header is a markdown like front matter and the body is an EJS templating engine. And then you just create new files and you can inject into those files as well. And you can see the example here, hygen component new uh, dash dash name avatar. So I want to create an avatar component and I get the, um, I've set this up. So I've got like the avatar JS file, the avatar story file, the spec file, and then I'm injecting it into the components index file and into the, the documentation to say, I've got this new component, for example. So this is what it would look like, right? It's, it's, it sounds scary when you say like, oh, EJS templating engine, oh, but it's actually really easy. So at the top is that your front matter and you just put two, where do you want it to go to? You want it to go to the folder called app, uh, the folder called workers, and in there, you want it to be the name that gets added into the CLI and then a JS extension. And here we've got like a message and we're saying message equals message dot to uppercase because you get helpers included with hygiene. So you've got all these cool helpers um, to make you uh, more productive as well. And then you've got this class with the name in capital letters, see the difference? And you're returning a function that returns that message, which is gonna be in, in uppercase. And then someone's gonna type in and they're gonna basically um, get this file created from. So really easy. Um, and you can also do cool things like you can skip if, it, if it's already there. 
So say you wanted to inject something into the package, Jason. So you want to inject something like the React Native-FS, for example. Uh, you want it to go to package.json after dependency so you can decide where it goes. And then basically like skip it. If it already is there, then don't add it again. So that's kind of really cool feature as well. And you can also have like interactive prompts, right? So you can say, right, the type is an input, the name is message, and the message that the person is going to receive is what's your message, and then you like type it in the CLI. And you can even go one step further and have like this prompter thing. So you can say the type is input, the name is email, what's your email, and then if email, so if they actually you know added that email, then you can put another one saying email confirmation. Please type your email again, and you can continue on. And you can have so much fun with this; it's great fun. Now, Plop is another one. If you've ever used Plop before, I haven't, but um, it works pretty much the same and it's really, really cool. I know a lot of the React community are using that, so definitely check that out. I think the only difference is it's using inquirer prompts and handlebar templates. It's slightly different, but it kind of does more or less the same thing. Now, I want to talk to you about Bit because I work at Bit. So I'm going to talk to you about the generators we have. So we can basically um, generate our components. Now, a Bit component is a component basically in a folder. So inside the folder, you have an index file that exports the component. Then you have the component file that does whatever it does, like a button component, for example. And you have like um, a docs file, because we like to document our components, um, a composition file to see the different states of the button, a test file, because you should write tests, always write tests, and then like a styles file, so SCSS in this example. And basically, like that's a lot of work. Um, if you want to come and work, um, with bit and you have to like create all those files every single time you just walk away right you'd say there's no way am i doing all this work so creating a generator that generates all those files for you is just like yeah it's so needed and you can basically decide what goes inside those files now this is kind of really important so as i said we document our components and i want people on the team to document the components the way i want them to document it because i'm like i like rules i used to be a teacher no seriously um so yeah, you want them to give like like labels. I want you to add a label. Now, if I don't add that label in there at the top, they're probably going to forget to add the labels because you know they're busy. Developers are busy, um, so they're not going to think about these things. But if it's already there, they're just going to have to change label one to a label that says button or primary or whatever. So that makes it easier for for the developers. And we can also say like. I want an actual Figma embed component inside the documentation. So I want basically that the component has the design right there in the documentation. Now, if I'm going to tell the developer, yeah, you just got to import the Figma embed component and then just add the source to it, they'll just forget, right? They'll never read the instructions. But if I put it in the documentation and the code that gets generated, when they start to work on this component, they get this and all they've got to do, like it says source equals URL to Figma. I mean, they're going to figure that out, I hope. And they're going to add that URL to Figma. And then, bang, they're going to have a better developer experience. So this is what's really important to like, you know, give them that kind of code. And the same with tests, right? You know, we want people to write tests. But writing tests is hard. If you just like create the test file for them, they're still not going to have time. And they're going to forget. And what kind of tests do you want them to write? What are you using? How do you want them to write it? So if you basically tell them, right, we're using testing library React. So this is like already imported for them. So then it's easy for them to say like, okay, I can use testing library React. Great, I know what to test. And then give them an example. Now this is a super simple example. It's just like, you know, getting by text and hello from and expecting it to be true. It's a terrible test. But by having this code here, it makes it very easy for me to say, oh, I can just modify that. And like very easy, I don't have to go to testing library documentation to try and see, oh, how do I write that again? Is it it? Is it what? Is it et cetera? So yeah, giving them some sort of minor little boilerplate um, makes lives just so much easier. And then it's easy just to keep uh, making sure that your developers are creating tests. So using your generator in Bit is very easy. Bit create my component button, and this is going to generate those files for you. Isn't it a lot of work you're saying, right? You know, generating, creating all those things. And you know, the thing is you create it once and you're gonna use it many, many times. Believe me, you're gonna save five minutes today. It's only five minutes you're gonna save, but you're gonna save five minutes tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. And all those minutes add up. Now, multiply that by the amount of developers in your company, those five minutes, that's like a lot of time. So it also makes it easier to onboard developers because you just say, just generate the component and go from there. It's all there for you. And that ensures not just standards, 
but it also helps the developers concentrate on what they're meant to concentrate on, which is doing what they're paid to do, which is build the component and actually create that code and forget about all that other stuff that, you know, is just repetitive stuff that they don't want to do, right? So what if we need to make changes, right? Because we do, we, we make changes all the time, we're changing things. And this is an issue, kind of, but with bits, Every component, even our generator, it is a component and every component is isolated and it basically has its own version. So you can version a component, even the generator, and then you can just install that into any other workspace or project. So it makes it easy to maintain things because you have one component that does all this that just gets versioned. And then to use it, it's simple of just like using it with bit um, NPM or yarn, you just install it and choose which version you want to use. So maybe, um, I don't know, maybe you're changing your design system and you came from Adobe design and that has on the documentation that one. And then we've moved to Figma because Figma is like ruling the world right now. And the old version had the Adobe, but now you've changed to Figma. So the new version has got Figma. And until you're ready and have those, those designs, then you could basically like use the old version on one project, the new version, another project. You can choose which one you want to use. So what about starting new projects, right? I want to start new projects. I don't want to create all that kind of boilerplate stuff again and again and again and again. So we also have like workspace generators. And if you're working in Bit, we call it working in a workspace and that's where you build all your components. So you can create this and um, I've called it Learn Bit Workspace and I've given a description so the developers know what it does. And then I can say, right, I want the workspace JSON file. That's my biggest config file. I want to generate that. And I'm also generating a gitignore and a readme file. Really important, right? Because they might forget to write a readme file and then just like send it up to GitHub. And then it's like, oh, terrible, right? So uh, basically you can create these files the way you want them to, to have things done. And you can create more and more of these as you, as you wish. And then basically you can also add components. So if there's a specific component you wanted to add there. So they had like a guidance of how to build something. You can particularly, you can just add it and it will import that component into the workspace for them. So it's kind of really cool. So what about configs? So with Bit, everything, is an, everything that's in a config, we call it an environment, right? And an environment is just a component, but it's an environment component. And what we do is we apply the environment on every single component. So we create this environment component and we apply things like TypeScript, ESLint, Prettier. We put all the configs in this component. And then when we're building our components, we say, we want you to use this environment. So it's extending the React environment in this case, but it's using TypeScript and Jest and ESLint, et cetera. And then every time you create a component, it's gonna be created based on what's in those configs of this environment. So that makes it really cool. Um, and every component is gonna be using the same environment, right? And as it's a component, you can basically like, you know, create a version of it, and then you can install it into any workspace that you want. And if you make a change, you just create a new version and then everyone gets the new version with the new changes that you made. So pretty cool. But I know you're all kind of saying, yeah, Debbie, we're talking about Bit and we haven't got to use Bit. And I know, cause I'm like trying to do my job as a developer advocate to get you all to use Bit, but you haven't got there yet. And you're still just building your Nux projects, your next projects, your Gatsby project, whatever. And that's totally cool. So you can still use Bit to help you with your configs. And I'm gonna show you how. So. We want to share ESLN config because like, come on, you've got like 10 projects, right? And you're copying, pasting this ESLN config file again and again and again across every single project, right? Admit it, because that's what I was doing. And um, yeah, it's it's a nightmare. And then you're like, you know, you need to add a new rule or you, you know, you're changing things, et cetera. You need to modify it. Then you need to go into every single project and modify that rule. Nightmare, right? So now you can actually use bit to create a component called an ESLint config component. I've called it my ESLint. You can call it whatever you want. So you create the component and it basically has like this. I put one rule, no console error. I wanna like break it. If they're putting a console log, it's just gonna break. Yeah, love that rule. So basically we create that. And then in our component, um, as I said, every bit component is in a folder. So it needs an index file and it's just gonna export um, export that file so that it can be used. And you can add documentation to document what it's gonna do, et cetera. So that's it, that's all you need to do. That was easy, right? How do I use it? So now I go to my next JS project, my Nux JS project, my view uh, application, whatever you're using, and I basically just install it. So obviously like I'll have exported it to the BitCloud, so it's up there in the cloud, so I can now install it 
um, using Yarn, using NPM, or using Bit if you're, if you're inside a Bit project. But if you're not, just use Yarn or NPM. That's totally cool. And basically add it as a dev dependency. This component is now there, right? And now I just like set up my um, my lint and I've called it my ES lint here, but this is the wrong title. This should be just like the um, um, the lint file in your actual Next.js project or Nux.js project. That's what happens when you you know change your slides at the last minute. So yeah, inside you put your module.exports and then you're extending, right? So I'm extending this component and then I'm adding the rules so I can, I can, I can override rules as well, which you might say, but that's not creating standards then because they can override the rules. But then, you know, pull requests and stuff, you can say, hey, don't add any more rules in here or whatever. But you're getting all those rules from that component that was created, which is going to have that console warning error. Yes, love it. So that's it, right? And then if you want to change something, so I've got no console error, and maybe I want to modify that to, because error is quite hard. Let's maybe I want to modify it to warning or add another rule. I just do that in the component I created using bit. I create like that new rule, and then I export a new version. So I've now got version 0.0.2 .0 or whatever. And then in my Nuxt.js project, Nuxt.js project, et cetera, I just install that new version. And that's it. That's just, then it just gets applied. Like It's as simple as that. And we can also do this for Prettier as well. So the same concept, right? There's sometimes a little bit of syntax difference. So um, Prettier requires you to spread it. So you're just spreading the Prettier config, for example. But you just create that component, upload it to bit, and then you basically just like, you know, import it into uh, the Prettier RC, make a change, create a new version, and bang, that's it, simple. Um, Tailwind, Tailwind is another one, right? How many times have you had like a Tailwind config file and you've got, you do work, like loads of work in changing the spacing, changing everything. And then you're like, oh, I need that in another project. And it's a nightmare, right? So sharing the Tailwind config is a great one as well. You create that as a component in bit, and then basically you export that and you use it in your Tailwind config in whatever project that you're using. So um, yeah, basically import the Tailwind and here we're spreading the Tailwind config and then override stuff as you want to, because you know you want to have power to just go that extra bit as well. So yeah, that's kind of um, a lot to take in. I know it's like I'm blowing your mind. So let me just like tell you, it is now time to play with generators. And seriously, like you're gonna solve the problem once, and then you're going to reuse it, and it's going to save time. And it's seriously going to save the cognitive load. And like that component that I created, you saw how simple it was. That was really easy. That just created one thing, one rule, save it as a component into the cloud, install it in my projects, and use it across any projects, multiple projects. And you can even do that, like seriously. Now, although it's time to play with generators, don't just think I'm going to create that once, and then I'm going to walk away from it and never see it again, because that's that's not good. It's really important to maintain your generators. Like it's an ongoing project. Think of it as something that, you know, those configs, they change over time and that's totally cool. So you can modify them, you can maintain it, you can create new versions and export them and then just, you know, make sure you're using the newer version in your projects, as simple as that. And that's basically it. And thank you very much for listening. And I've created this QR code, which I hope it works. <laughs> and basically, if you use the QR code, you'll be able to um, open up the example that I created like literally an hour ago of the ES lint, right? And you can then use Yarn, use NPM, install it into your project. I dare you to try it out. Install it into your project and uh, basically add a console log into one of your JS files and watch your project break because Debbie's not going to let you have any console logs in your project. And that's how you create standardization and scale your teams very easily. So, yep, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you very much and have fun with the QR code. <laughs>